Hi, everyone. Welcome to the uh, BTB Game Changers podcast. Got a good one for you this week. Um, really um, interested and um, almost gonna, probably going to be a bit of therapy for me this as well. Um, you know, got Joe Trodden joining us today, um, josephtrodden.com. Um, we're going to talk about high performance, high performance uh, in particular with teams. And I think um, as, a, as a business owner and uh, but at, at any level, this is going to be an issue. This is going to be a challenge. It always is, always has been. Uh, but the good news is um, there's experts out there like Joe um, who are here to help. So as the purpose of this podcast is to get, you know, really interesting people in and talk about these kind of topics and some of them kind of difficult topics. Um, you know, Joe, just want to thank you. Thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. Thanks very much for having me, Lee. It's uh, great to be here. Cool. So Joe, look, let's start at the beginning first and um, talk a little bit about how did you get into what you're, you're doing now, you know, working with uh, entrepreneurs and teams to, you know, to get high performance. Okay. Um, well, the, the short story is go through, go through school, do quite well, go and do a law degree because I wasn't really thinking about who I am or what I was supposed to be doing with my life, just that you get good grades so you go and do something like law. Uh, so I did a law degree, came out, did IT for a year because all the money was in that. And I had a, a wake up about like early 30s just walking into work uh, being the same, you know, the same route to work and maybe walked it a thousand times. Uh, and I just thought, I, I can't continue with this. Like, what am I doing? You know, I don't, I don't care what happens in this, uh, in this IT job today. So from there, I'd always been interested in people's heads. I looked at mental health for a while. Um, but it wasn't about it became a little, not exactly um, just nurturing, but it wasn't about like high performance. You know, it was um, about getting people just back to a place of like a baseline of almost safety. And it wasn't really right for me. I'd always been interested in um, creating change and business was the way to do it. So the more I sort of explored it, the more it was about people's mindsets, how they operate, and then using business as the mechanism to affect change and bring ideas to life. You know, these were the things that were really exciting. So from there, I worked with uh, an accelerator. I did a couple of bits and pieces in between, but I worked with an accelerator, which is quite a pivotal change point for me. Um, there was a, a guy in there, Jim Duffy, who really opened my eyes to mindset and performance. And from there, I split off and did my own thing. And now I, I focus specifically on a, a particular set of entrepreneurs who are going through one of their, what I call inflection points, one of their growth stages. I don't typically work with like enormous businesses because they move too slow for me, man. Like I like businesses that are going out and making things happen um, and that build teams, which is, you know, part of the conversation that we're going to have today. No, definitely. And um, what made you go on your own? So, you know, working in an accelerator, <laughs> and, uh, which is, you know, I, I guess a lot of kind of entrepreneurs and startups and, fast moving businesses and then what was the leap to go and do it yourself? Do you know the, there was a, a push because we were supported by a bank um, and honestly it was great the support they gave fantastic but then they took the accelerator in-house which made a lot of sense so they could align it with their own objectives and KPIs but I just don't work well in large organizations you know because of the like I say the pace and things happening and the you know you need a you need a fingerprint and a lock of hair to change a, a color on a document or something. Do you know, like it's just, I, I get it. And you need to do that at a certain level, but it's not for me. And I've always just had my own vision and my own way of doing things. You know, I really like to take a hundred perspectives on something and then create something from that, you know, to stand on the shoulders of giants. So really it was about, I want to work with a certain set of, of people and I want them, uh, I want to use certain tools and methods and ways with them. And to do that, you've, you know, you've got to strike out on your, your own, you know, to do it your own way. So I've also had that drive to create my own thing. Um, but the best way for me to do that, I've found, is through working with entrepreneurs to, to do their thing. I wouldn't actually class myself as an entrepreneur because I'm not trying to build like a, a, a large organization. I like the agility and the multiple different scenarios and arenas that I get to operate in. 
Um, but yeah, you can just choose your own path the same as any entrepreneur can. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that there is a, it's interesting, there is a stark difference between a big business and a, a, a smaller business. But it's interesting because I, I read a lot of books and I know you do too. And, but I, I'm, over the last 10 years, what I've kind of noticed is a lot of the bigger businesses are trying to use the methodologies that are, have kind of been born in startup businesses and and then trying to take that kind of template and plug it into a big business is is really really different difficult and we see that all the time with our clients right in, in terms of that whole machine is just a bigger machine a bigger challenge and, and often dressed up as change which is that mm. word change mm. which i hate right and change management uh, in particular because it's so generic meaningless you know, it's kind of been a trash can for kind of everything in business. And uh, so I want to explore that more. And I also want to explore the tools, right? Because I mm. think that's unique about you. We've known each other for a while now, um, but it's also unique about your approach. I think um, in this industry or the industry that you're in, right, in terms of uh, consulting around change and teams and high performance, there's too much talk and theory and less practical, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's definitely something about this podcast is we want to make it a resource where it's really getting practical and exploring some interesting ideas. Um, so look, let me, let me start by, uh, I, in my own experience, right? In terms of, um, because uh, we could, I was thinking about, you know, where should we start with this topic? Cause it's huge, but in my experience as an entrepreneur and the business owner working in big businesses, small businesses, um, and I like both, uh, but I am definitely a more of a, a special forces type CEO, right? Small teams. And, and that's my definition of a team, right? Is kind of a high performance, special form of forces. That's what I want to be. That's what I want to develop and grow. Uh, getting there is the difficult bit. And I think from my own experience this morning, I had a team meeting and I won't go into too much specifics, but I think it's, it's a very, very difficult thing to do um, because it is about mindset. Um, it is about understanding where everybody's at and understanding some of the challenges. And, and one of the things I'm really keen on and explore this topic of transparency, mm. right? And I want to get your view on that. And, you know, for me, that's a fundamental piece of the jigsaw, but a very, very difficult thing to actually do in practical terms because sure. of the way we work. So can you talk a little bit about that and transparency and how, it, you know, how you use that maybe in, 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 in what you do with your clients? Sure, sure. So one of the, the key things there, I mean, you know, I won't, I won't go into too much about like the benefits of teams, right? Everybody knows, should know the benefit of those, the different perspectives are going to bring, the different experiences, cognitive diversity, you know, the way people interpret the world and think like you want that. You don't want a team of clones because nothing will happen. You know, you need all of those different perspectives. But some of the challenges around um, getting the most out of that team is this whole sense of identity and true transparency. So if you look at the thing that um, Google talked about in psychological safety, you know, that a team should feel this psychological safety, that they can voice things, that they're not going to be um, attacked, that it's okay to admit mistakes. Like the theoretical premise of that, yes, I 100% agree with, but that is incredibly hard to actually implement. Because what you've got is people's sense of identity around a table. So I often ask about like, who are they, who are they bringing in? You know, who's, who's the person that's coming into this meeting and what is on their agenda? Because if they are coming in with, um, they are protecting their own fiefdom, you know, they've got, they've got their own objectives and, you know, that's what they're there to defend and everything, um, every conversation they want to have is to defend that they're doing a good job and that other people aren't. Um, Or this meeting should be geared towards me obtaining my objectives rather than actually thinking the level up from that about 
well, what does the company actually need? So you've got this sense of identity that comes in. Of course, the power dynamics as well. I work with growing companies and um, there's, there's a group typically of what I call the originals, who are the ones, and they call themselves that as well, um, inadvertent, inadvertently. It's the ones who've been there kind of from the start. And then that seems to confer some sort of unspoken uh, length of tenure about you know what, how much they can challenge in their position not even, it's not even in relative to the hierarchical structure of the organization or experience or anything like that. It's this length of tenure thing. So you've got this group of originals and then it's trying to integrate the new people into that. So you've got like all these various identities that are flowing subconsciously even into that dialogue. So when you're asking people to be transparent, you're putting all of that on the table, right? You're saying, what's the fear that you're bringing in here? What's the thing that you're trying to protect in your identity? Like, who are you around this table? And they are very difficult questions for people to, to want to answer. You know, that takes a massive commitment to say, yeah, I do actually think because I've been here longer than you, I can overrule you. I mean, nobody's saying that, right? But it's the stuff that's happening under the table. So this is why transparency is quite hard. Um, but they, it, it can be done if you get people to commit. Yeah, no, definitely. And, 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 you know, just to explore that a bit, but because I've seen that in my own experience in big companies as well as smaller companies, but it, it definitely is more prevalent in smaller companies where you have that kind of founder syndrome where, and I, I, I kind of building teams is, um, I, I think, akin to as close as you can get to your, your kind of family environment. Right. So at the beginning of the journey, and this, this kind of leads into the founder syndrome piece is at the beginning of the journey, everyone's aligned, right? Everyone's together. Everyone is, you know, sense of direction and, and everyone wants scale. And the reality of that is someone that is, to scale is going to have to change because you can't do what you were doing in the first six months, three years later, five times as big. And so you kind of have these issues of, um, you know, uh, it, like you're talking about in terms of meetings, I've been here longer. Um, maybe there's other people in the room who maybe perceive to be smarter, perceived to be doing a different job and kind of don't care that you've been here 10 years they actually just want results, right? And in, like in a family of trying to keep everybody together as we go through those changes, um, one of the qualities that I've kind of tried to zoom in on or tried to focus on to, to achieve that is just trying to preach, or sorry, preach the wrong word, promote open-mindedness, right? Is just be open-minded and then try and find those kind of individuals because no, it's not for everyone. Some people will need to exit the business. Some people will need to exit the team because you're mm. trying to do different things. But those individuals who could just be open-minded have a great chance in my experience. You, you know, is that, is, that, is that the kind of thing that you see when you're working with teams? Yeah, and depending on the, um, the founder, sometimes there is, I don't know if misplaced loyalty is the... the the, the, um, the right exactly the right term but the people that have been with them quite a long time it can be quite hard at times to certainly to exit them or even you know to to pull them up to say look this isn't the same as it was um because you raise a great point that it's not about going this is how it worked at the start so we just do that at five times you don't like the, the dynamics are completely going to change and the ownership and people get more specialized and you know, things are going to change. And it's the question of whether they want to adapt with that. I mean, you look at Silicon Valley and you don't have somebody who goes in and does like the marketing function and stays with the company long term. You have the person who goes in to run the marketing function when they're at this type of size and that type of turnover. And when they cross the threshold, then they leave and they go and do the same role in a, another company that's at that size because it's a very specific type of role. So you, rather than trying to sort of play catch up in terms of their learning, that's not what they want to do. They want to be the person who will take you from, you know, 
B to C or from C to D. It's a bit like my own work as well. That's why I say I like to work with a certain set of entrepreneurs because I recognize what those challenges are. So like I say, sometimes there's a bit of a, a misplaced loyalty. And the, the problem can be as well that it gets, it, it just creeps up. You know, it's not like there's a, a power dynamic that's just there, that just appears, because then you can deal with it. But it, it just it kind of creeps into the, uh, the conversation. And at some point, there is like a line in the sand of, hey, this is what's really going on here. Is this, you know, what, what do we want to do about this situation? Um, so, it, it, yeah, it sometimes does require that. It's, it's the incremental change that, that can mess things up. And really that person um, being honest about what do they really want. You know, it's like me leaving. That was, that was great. I love working for Entrepreneurial Spark. And it would have been quite uh, cosy, I guess, to stay there. We'd had good exposure to more entrepreneurs. But it wasn't who I wanted to become. But I've also been through various, you know, I've run my own business. I've worked in various um, other jobs. And do you know what I mean? Like the change, I was, I was up for the change. If it yeah. wasn't giving me who I was wanting to become, I wasn't afraid of like leaving and doing something else. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think it's a line in the sand sometimes that needs to be drawn. Yeah, I think the, 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 uh, it, I've, I've definitely experienced that myself. I think the open-mindedness for me, and this isn't, you know, this is a dynamic, we should state this, this isn't a dynamic that is just about founders. You, you know, if, if uh, this is about managing teams, right? So mm, for you sure. could, you know, I could take over a business or I, you know, an individual listening to this podcast could be taking over a team and some of those team members might have been there for 10 years. And it's the same it's exactly the same dynamic. Um, I think one of the things that I said, uh, uh, open-mindedness is uh, one of the things I've tried to distill down into, you know, what are the characteristics of, of open-mindedness? And because I think you then have a chance, right? Is if, if that individual in that team is pining for what it was like, right? Mm -hmm. We used to do things this way, right? Sure. Um, and you know, everything was great then, right? It was perfect. There was never a problem and everything was great. Uh, or the other side of it is the, and I, I'll use one of your terms in terms of the, these individuals become saboteurs then. Mm. And, mm. I, and I've seen unbelievable examples of people will literally cut their own legs off underneath them <laughs> just to not support um, you know, some of those changes and, and I yeah. kind of step back sometimes and go, wow, that's yeah. actually like, you know, literally cutting your own legs beneath you just because you don't want to support that other individual or that sure. decision or that direction. It's crazy. Again, that's for me, that's identity and power dynamics. You know, that if um, the identity of I know who I was in the old world, like I had this status, I had this amount of knowledge, I had a, a, a modus operandi, like all of these, all of these uh, certainties conferred a certain status on me and an identity. And then how do, you, how do you let that go? Because if you're talking about these growth organizations, it is going to change. If you are in that large organization, you can stay in that identity for pretty much as long as you want, if that's what you want to do. Like when you get to a certain size in an organization, you don't want the people that are always striving to, well, you don't want everybody to be like that. Like you could do with a few settled players that you know are going to do a role for you. They're going to do it really well. Don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about passengers. I'm talking about people who are, who reach a, they're called rock stars in my, um, I can't remember who was it that came up with that. I think it was, um, it's in radical candor, but they talk about rock stars and shooting stars is the one I use. Like the rock stars are the ones who do an amazing job for you. And they always want to learn more about how to do like their particular role better. The shooting stars are the ones who do a pretty good job at each level, but always want to be pushing through. And you need these combinations, right? But you need people to be aligned to the strategic aims of the, the organization. So when you were talking about family, I know we talked before about Reid Hoffman's alliance. Um, so the co-founder of LinkedIn. <coughs> And he's saying that families and friends just didn't work as a, a metaphor for what it was like in the business. You know, allies was, we're probably not going to be together forever, but it's about see while we're together, help us with the aims of the company and we'll help you do the things that you want to do. 
And this really helps with that alignment and making that choice. So if you've got a strategic timeline that goes out, say even three, six months, okay, so this is where the business is going. Who do you think you need to become by this six month point? I need to be, oh, I'll just be the same person that I am now. Okay, there isn't a job for that person in this reality though. You know, look at that, this is a strategic timeline, right? So that, that job won't exist. So do we need to have a conversation about you perhaps finding something else? And the shooting stars, or even the rock stars as well, but the, the others will find a way. Um, not Well, find a way is the wrong term there. The others will want a way that they can develop. You know, if you create that culture of that perpetual development, they're looking at that alliance timeline going, yeah, I can be better at public speaking here, or I want to learn more about management, or even that skill set, you know, that technical skill set. I want to master that. And these are the tools that really help people to align. Because I talked to you before about people make the choice. You know, you don't say to them, I, you need to be this. It's about, this is what the company needs. Is that who you want to become? And then the ownership is on them. Um, so I, I do think if you talk about practical tools, again, it's a good book, uh, the, the Alliance, um, but that whole thing about the choice is yours. We talk about no excuses as well. That's one of our, we share that as a, a pretty much a favorite mantra to go, this is on you. It's not, you know, you, you take ownership, you take responsibility. So that's a really good tool to look at that. Mm, no, definitely. I, I agree with that. I think that's definitely one more we'll put in as we will with everything into the show notes. I think the, um, you know, we're, I, I think we're both fans of Ray Dalio and you know, <laughs> yeah. the, although that's probably at the extreme end of, uh, of a lot of this stuff uh, and, um, but certainly definitely my end. And, I think the, the, the one of the, the one of the things in that book that was profound for me and one that we have in our business is this you know uh, the, the this concept of how you deal with what you don't know is mm. more important than than kind of anything else um, sure. and that it, it, that's why it keeps coming back to me to that, that it was a definition of being open minded mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. is uh, I understand that in this team, and as I said, this team could be a board or it could be a, a marketing team or a sales team, is I don't know it all. Mm. And I'm more interested in what I don't know. And I'm willing to kind of put the ideas out there. Mm. I'm willing to, you know, let people kick the tires. And I'm going to be completely open minded, but I'm going to respect the people around me. Um, you know, is it is a massive, massive um, issue and and one I've seen actually you know make a lot of sense for people and and make some big improvements on. Um, so that's definitely one that you know people also also should read as well. Uh, principles if you if you really want to get into the uh, the hardcore of this stuff and, and <laughs> yeah, uh, as yeah. you as as you know. Um, <laughs> but but transparency in particular is a topic. Is it, it is a and I've talked to you about this offline, but it is a culture. You know, I, 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 culture is often another one of those words that is kind of banded around. What does it mean? But uh, a, a, a definition of culture for me is transparency and has to be worked at over a period of time. Mm. Um, it isn't something that's going to happen quick. And I've, I've experienced that in my own uh, businesses and also transparency with customers, transparency with your partners, mm. all of these kind of things. It's a, it's a philosophy rather than just a statement. Hmm. It's, it's the, the key thing for me um, increasingly is about these mechanisms um, to encourage people to think in a certain way. So if you look at AJ, AJ Laffley, so the CEO of Procter & Gamble, um, playing to win is his strategy book. It's not bad. It's a bit dated, but there's some really good stuff in there about how they, they ran um, Procter & Gamble and the changes they made there. But there's something great in, in that about his leadership team. So he noticed that, again, he had all these brilliant people around the table, but it just became a battle, um, a battleground. So he got them to shift the dynamic from advocacy which is where you come in with an idea or a presentation and you are, your mindset is, I am right. You know, I, I am right, I've got this thing, I'm right, and I'm going to defend. To what you called the set of inquiry, which was, this is what I think is the right thing, but I'm probably missing something. Can you help me to see what that is? 
Now that is a really small change, but massively powerful because mm. now instead of that thing being you're on trial at the front, you're, you're supposed to be saying, I know that I'm missing something because I only bring in one perspective. And it really helps if people understand their identity and their cognitive style because they know the things that they will miss. Like, for, for example, I know that I always want to close the, the loop on things. You know, I always want to move, move forward, move forward, and I don't let things emerge enough. I know that I don't always put people's feelings at the top of my agenda. Do you know about how, how people are actually going to feel when, because I'm like, progress, move, move. So then I know that because I've got a certain style and it's good, but by definition, I'm going to have these blind spots, right? So him having his boardroom meeting and saying, that's a position to adopt. Like, here's what I've got. And it is good work. Don't show up with sloppy work. But here's what I've got. But I'm probably missing something. Can you help me to see what that is? I mean, that's, that's an awesome uh, shift in terms of changing a conversational dynamic. Yeah, massively powerful. And then... Um... Uh, again, I think uh, Ray Dalio talks about something similar in terms of, you know, just be willing to put it out there and let people kick the tires. And, mm. you know, who's the most believable in the room? Believability for me is another mm. real practical tool, certainly mm -hmm. for decision making. Um, but behind all of that, which is, again, a, you know, something I want to deep dive into is this, this concept of crucial conversations mm -hmm. by which, mm -hmm. you know, um, you... Uh, you provided me with that kind of badge, right? That's a bumper sticker kind of management technique, right? For mm -hmm. me is, and they go on, but don't, you know, do not go on enough in a business. Mm -hmm. And, sure. you know, the kind of framework of trying to set out a conversation, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not, it's not for everyone. It's not for everyone, this kind of thing, because actually, you know, thinking about every conversation you have, what type of conversation is it? What the outcomes do I want out of it? But in a, in a business practicality setting, it's so, so powerful. And we've experienced mm -hmm. that, you know, and seen that um, in our own business, you know, where, where, you, where you helped us with that. But can you talk a little bit more about that and, you know, crucial conversations, the tools, the techniques, you know, how to set up a conversation and, and educate the teams? Sure. So you look at crucial conversations. These are the ones that are tough. So you've got a difference of opinion, they're likely to be emotionally charged. Um, what, what happens in that is that people will either go to a, a, what's called silence or violence. So they will either attack when, say, say I've got a problem with you. So then I, you know, I voice that and then you're going to re react in a certain way. And again, it's your amygdala, the fear center in your brain. It's all to do with your identity again. I don't like this situation either. You're maybe you go with violence if you feel are you saying I'm not smart enough? Are you saying that I've done something wrong? Or depending on your psychological makeup, you go, oh no, I've done something wrong. Oh, I'll, I, you know, I want out of this situation now. So again, this is all about identity, right? All flowing from how you react to certain situations. But your amygdala is doing it. Um, a quick sidebar on your amygdala though is that it holds memories that you can um, rewire. So like your amygdala, if you think about public speaking as an example, people are terrified of that. You can't just say, well, I'm just not going to be terrified of that anymore. Ta-da! Like it doesn't work like that. You need to put yourself in that situation, like repeatedly, which yeah. is what um, Ray Dalio is doing with his company, right? He's repeatedly putting people in those difficult situations. And then you either adapt to that because you want that or you leave because it's just the, the, you know, the psychological load of that is too much for you. So you have to be a particular type. But so you've, you have the difficult conversation, amygdala flares up, you will attack or you will withdraw. And then you'll typically either try and force a point of view so you don't get any commonality. There's no ownership. It just becomes about a hierarchy. Or you dilute what you're going to say so you don't really make the point. But you're like, well, I had the conversation, though. Do you know, it didn't go exactly the way I wanted. So the key thing with that is about narratives. Um, first of all, agreeing that, look, if we are going to make progress, we're going to have to have difficult conversations, right? The motive is the important thing. If the motive is, I am going to get one over on you, forget it. Like, 
you're, I don't want you in my company anyway, right? If you're, you know, if it's all about just trying to score your own, keep your own scoreboard. But if the motive is we've got a common goal, and again, this all comes back to the framework, the yeah. strategic framework. We've got a common goal that we're trying to get to. And this is the story that I've got about what's happening at the moment. Not here is what's happening. Here's what you're doing. Here's this situation. You know, I, my objective reality is now yours. We've got the difficult um, scenario that's happening up. Here is my story. Too often people will give an opinion without the narrative. Like an opinion is an end point of a thought process. Yeah. So if you start talking about opinions, it's, it's just another battleground. Yeah. With crucial conversations, you're saying, we've got this objective we're trying to get to. We're going to have a difficult conversation, like to prepare you for that. You know, we talked about that framework that we were going to use. I feel that we've got a level of trust where I can use it. And you might not like what I've got to say, but I feel it's important. Here's my story. Not here is my opinion about you. <laughs> like here is the story that I've got and why I think that's going to cause us problems on our roadmap. So, you know, that, that we have this dysfunction in the team. And if we don't have people aligned, I don't think we're going to be able to, you know, approach that customer in the right way because it will depend who they speak to. So I don't think that team's well uh, trained enough. You know, I think we might have a, a problem there. Don't say that about my team, blah, blah. No, then it's about, okay, tell me more about that. What's your story? And then you come at this commonality at the end. The key thing with that, motive is so important, man. Honestly, motive is so important. And that's back to identity, that if you're there to just protect yourself and your fiefdom and your identity, your sense of self, and you will do that at a subconscious level as well, that's going to be really hard to do. But if you can follow a framework and get people to agree to things like that, um, it's, it's, yeah, it, what a difference it makes. I mean, I do it. You know, we, we've had that situation where I'm going, look, we need to have a crucial conversation. And the other person knows exactly what it is. They know that my motive is sound, that I've got the best interests of the company and them at heart, but it's going to be something that might jar with them. But we're ready for it. We're psychologically prepared. And we know we're going to try to work to this uh, common outcome at the other side. So again, yeah, it's a really it's a great book, um, great framework to use. Definitely one for the show notes. Yeah, definitely. I think the that 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 you know, the, if we while we're talking here, while you were talking, I'm thinking how how many businesses really focus on this area? And it's you know virtually uh, none. Virtually none. And where this is what it's all about. You know, if you, obviously I have a bit of a background in sport and if I go into, you know, the professional arena of support of sports, I know what my predominantly know what my end goal needs to be. Right. Um, if I'm an Olympic athlete, I know I might have in four years, I might have the Olympics and I've got to kind of got my moment in time and I'm going to work back with my trainer what actions I need to take and mm -hmm. in a team environment it's the, it's the same thing and mm -hmm. you have exactly the same characteristics you know the kind of dressing room after the match <laughs> was often where a lot of those cru crucial conversations will go on yeah but in business which is kind of the same process the same methodology these kind of things get don't get said Right. They, you know, we may have, and that's hard, you know, do we have a clear goal, a clear mm -hmm. outcome, a clear strategy? Then yep. once that's in place, it's okay. Are, are we working towards that collectively, which is absolutely crucial. And then is every decision we take off that part of moving us forward towards that outcome? You know, you and I are a fan of OKRs, which we, mm -hmm. we I'm actually going to do a podcast in the next few weeks with someone on OKRs and that align back to that. But these things are very, very difficult and time consuming. So mm -hmm. it's kind of no surprise that virtually no time in businesses gets spent in this area, but the impact is huge. Absolutely sure. massive. Sure. I mean, it's this thing of, well, how much groundwork do you want to put in? Like this is, yeah. this is another challenge around conversations um, and working in teams. First off that, that point there about the alignment, if you don't have that, you can forget it, right? If you've got to have the team all going, like your leadership team should be able to tell you what the strategy is. Not like I, I as a CEO can present the strategy, right? Say you've got a leadership team of six. 
everybody should be able to give that presentation. Okay, they can use the PowerPoint, right? They can use the notes, but like everybody should be able to explain what that is and why, you know? Because if you don't have that, then when you do run into things like the difficult conversations, you can't point to anything objective. You can't point to the OKRs and go, yeah, but look, that was, you know, we were, we're trying to hit this number. So the story I've got in my head is, if we continue on that path, I don't think we're going to be able to do that. What's the story that you've got? Bang, what a totally different conversation that is to you're not doing your job properly, you know? Yeah, but I am because I'm doing this and here's the, you know, here's my sales target or here's my whatever the, the target is that they're working towards. If you can't always pull that back to here's the main strategy and here's my narrative about how we're going to, we are off the thing that we agreed. I'm pointing away at the wall here. The thing that we agreed that we were going to do, like that's not, that's not up for debate anymore. We've had our debate around that strategic timeline. That's what we're doing. So then it's the, the conversation about, and my story is this, what's, what have you got? I'm probably missing something. What's the thing that you've got? Totally different conversations, but it's about, it's about giving people those tools and everyone's yeah. uh, subscribing to that way of working. Um, and that's got but, to be explicit. Yeah, that's, that, but that, I think that's the key is, is um, you've got to give people the tools. Mm. You know, in my own experience and working with clients, uh, working in in businesses and 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 in the and in all of the best circumstances, there's been a relatively detailed and I like detail. Um, I've become to like detail. Um, a relatively detailed, let's say, strategy, operating model, whatever you you kind of want to call it, uh, mm -hmm. plan, sales plan, marketing plan. Uh, get it ninety percent down the line, right? I think that's the leader's job. Right, put something on a table, be willing, but then you're going to get, you know, once you get put it on the table, you're going to be called dictatorial, but that's, you know, part of the, um, you know, part of the, the kind of circumstances and say, <laughs> right, let's kick the ties of this. As you said, right, let, I, I, I don't know at all, right? I'm open minded, but this is what I think we should do. Mm -hmm. And then get that alignment around it and then provide people with the tools. So you've now got the strategic plan in place. Mm. Now let's provide people with the tools to not be threatened every time, you know, uh, something comes up in regards to, you know, sharing numbers or sharing performance or mm. looking at someone else's performance. And then it's a, as I said, that amig amygdala comes back at you, in instantly hits you and you go into that kind of threat mode. And, and that's the, that's the key, I think, from a, because, it, you know, the, in my own experience, I've seen individuals, personal development, um, who you know, want to learn, reading books, thinking about these things consistently, but there's very few of them. So at a, at a scale, you've got to provide those tools. It's absolutely mm. crucial because CEOs or leaders are great at expecting things, people to get it, right? Mm -hmm. And I've experienced mm -hmm. that in my own <laughs> career. Um, expectation management um, or expecting the people just to get it um, was, was definitely one of my um, philosophies at the beginning of management and I learned the hard way there. But let, let, before we get into the tools, because I want you to talk about some of the practical tools that we're talking about here, what are the kind of concepts that uh, the listeners can kind of, you know, do more research in or reach out to you on? Because the, this is where I think it, it becomes really valuable because it's, it's easy to wax lyrical about this stuff over and over again, but what are the practical tools? But I wanna, I wanna touch on this subject of honesty, which mm -hmm. is, uh, again, I get your view on it. I, I, it's a, 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 an overused word, and I think you've pointed to some of this um, already, is uh, it's my honesty. You know, when I think I'm mm -hmm. being honest, that's my perspective, but not the, uh, the other, individuals perspective mm -hmm. so the difference between transparency this is what i think mm -hmm. right this is what i see this is the mm -hmm. story that i see uh and not presenting it as this is what's happening mm -hmm. and this is what i honestly believe for you to be doing do you, do, you, do you differentiate them is there a value in differentiating them in in a kind of practical terms with with uh in in, in meetings with teams or one-on-one -on -one management 
Well, like the, the evidence is important, right? So OKRs as a system says, do we do this or not? You know, rather than it being an ambiguous, yeah, we're kind of making progress, you know, like having the clarity of that target and being able to have the good reason if you, you know, if you're off track um, and not don't wait until the deadline to say, you know, it's another cultural mechanism, right? As soon as you, you've got a clear target, as soon as you don't think you're going to hit that, go and speak to your, your leader about it, you know, go and speak to the team about it. Don't wait until the meeting to go, oh, yeah, I only got that to 50% and you knew that a fortnight ago. Like, that's insane, right? So that, again, this is a bit of a cultural thing to go in there. So if we look at the honesty, you need that evidence in there. But again, if we're talking about the, the, the dynamics in the team, the permission to use clumsy language, like if the motive and the intention is there, then the group can call out, are you doing this X or Y? Do you know? Because that's not what we've all agreed to. Um, I don't know if this will directly answer your question, but I think it's an interesting thing to, to be calling out in meetings about, we touched on like positional and generative conversations. So the positional conversation, you imagine yourself, you're sitting around your um, leadership team uh, meeting or any team. So positional conversation is I've got a position, you've got a position and we're not moving. It's like lawyers in court. They're not trying to convince each other. They're trying to convince the decision maker. So if, if you're having a positional conversation and that's, you know, you need to have those at times, just call it out for what it is and not let's you and I have a debate for an hour and at the end of it, we're just, you know, no one's moved an inch. We're just in the yeah. trench. I've, morphine, I've, yeah. had, I've had exactly that this morning, right? Well, they, <laughs> in but, a meeting, yeah. Yeah, but you can, then you can call that out. If people know that's what that is. So there was a really interesting, there's a book called um, Dialogue, which, which is um, really good. So William Isaacs talks about this thing with, um, I think it was called Lion Foods and this undercover uh, reporting agency. So Lion Foods were up to some... Um, misdeeds you know as food production company so these undercover reporters went in and uh lion foods actually won a case against them because they although they exposed them they committed fraud by applying to go in as workers right so there's this big case about it so this talk show host gets them on and he says that what they agreed to do was to talk about the wider picture there like the ethics of what they were doing and why they would do that and how both parties could benefit so basically what you know where could the line be between being held to account and the media using spin and tactics to but that's not what happened right they just had a conversation where they were like you guys did some bad stuff in your factory oh yeah but you guys committed fraud to get in there it's a positional conversation so five minutes into that you can be going are we trying to learn anything new in this conversation? Is there anything that you think you might be missing from your position? And if the answer is no, fine. We'll shut up then because we've heard your position. Like, yeah. We get it. We all get it. If you're having a generative conversation, then you're saying, like we touched on before, I don't have everything. I don't have the full picture. I don't have all the answers. But if your team... and it, these things are not easy you know i'm talking about mm -hmm. this like you can just go in and go right everyone can now have crucial conversations because there's a book on it and a framework everybody can talk about their identity you can just use positional one of the key things is like don't try and change everything at once but if you can have that moment that's five minutes in going and it's not an attack it's just going have you got a position on that and are you do you think there's anything left for you to learn about you know this that might sway your position no what about you no cool so whose decision is it right decisions made and we move on you know like that's um that that's a thing when you're we're talking about it's just such a, a powerful tool because it's really simple and it just gets people to stop and think like are you trying to learn anything new here or have you got like a concrete position either's fine but just so we know and we know what we can do with this conversation from here have you experienced the the kind of people think that the de dehumor, uh, you know, they're becoming dehumanized by these kind of everything's got a framework, everything's got a position. We're setting out, you know, this is the conversation that we're going to have. Um, mm. You know, I, I, I think that for me, this is why I know. Um, I think it's Amazon that don't use powerpoints, right? And mm. um, they also uh, they write documents, right? Mm -hmm. And we we have a topic at the moment in um in our business which is it's quite a big strategic 
decision, right? And what I said, said, look, rather than let's talk about it, let's put together a paper, right? I'd like to understand everybody's views on paper because Mm -hmm. it's always easy to input. The cost of talking is very Mm -hmm. little. And Mm -hmm. what happens is what you were talking about before is kind of shooting from the hip. And, you know, my, this is my instant reaction and I'm going to shoot from the hip because this is what I think you're doing. And actually mm-hmm. the value of that is very little. Mm-hmm. And, but I, I, I kind of, you know, what, what people have said to me in the past is, look, you, you, everything's now dehumanized. There's a mechanism to it. You know, mm-hmm. what, what, and it's kind of got harping back to the past again. Right. Mm-hmm. But, it, and, and this is, as we've said from the outset, maybe not for everyone and maybe mm-hmm. why businesses don't touch it, right? Because, or actually go towards it, see how difficult it is, and then mm-hmm. kind of back away and go, oh, let's just keep doing what we're doing before. But mm-hmm. you, it, it, you know, maybe dehumanizing is the, that's how it was framed to me. But mm-hmm. you see, is that a, an outcome of possibly implementing these tools? I get, I get the principle. And I think, um, again, if you look at a large organization, like, they're so afraid of somebody saying the wrong thing to the wrong to, to somebody, Do you know, whether that's because there's the politics are, are there, um, whether it's to do with the fear that there'll be a, a case against them for, you know, some, I mean, look, look at Bridgewater, right? So if you look at Bridgewater and you've got people on iPads noting down live feedback while somebody's talking, and by the way, your meeting's being recorded so that everybody can like watch it later and give you feedback on it. I mean, I don't know what their HR uh, policies are like, right? But th- that's what people have subscribed to. Um, so it, it would depend on, on the culture. I think that the, when you talk about like the dehumanizing, I do understand that. And when I talked about my identity before, you know, I'm like, yes, a framework. Now there's a structure that we can think in and operate in. Magic, magic hour. Yeah. Um, it can happen. But you also can, it's quite difficult unless there is like a name that you can give to something. Like there's a thing that if you can't say it, you can't think it. You know, if you can't actually give it a, like this is what this situation is, it's just a really difficult abstraction to manage. Yeah. So it probably is a bit of a blind spot for me in terms of when you say the, I understand what you're, what you're getting at there with like, oh, right, everybody stop. We're having this type of conversation now. So here are the rules and, you know, everybody subscribe to this. If you can get the balance right, though, to go, you know, this is it. This is uh, everybody's like, we've got a position. It feels like you're, in a, a, you're having a, a positional conversation there. Is that what's going on? Because, nobody, because we agreed already, nobody wants to spend an hour just in the trenches, right? So, you know, we can bring that up. And if people are aware, like I, I'm not, I'm not perfect, but you know, I'm increasingly aware of that thing of like, close the loop, that I am going to forget the people. So when I hear somebody around the table talking about that, rather than going, yeah, I don't agree with that. I go, I know that's my blind spot. You know, like how that will emotionally impact X, Y, Z, or no, we need to give that a little bit more time before we make the decision. But because I've, I've got it, I can go, yeah, Joe, just shut up for five minutes and listen to this because this is your blind spot. So I think it is an, it's, it's an awareness thing, but it does have to be, in my experience, a little mechanical to start with. Hmm. Like the Crucial Conversations framework, like you are bumbling through that and going, I know we agreed to do this thing, but can, can I actually do that? You know, is that, is that something that's okay? Um, so it's a little bit, it can be a little bit uh, mechanistic at the start, I guess, but it just depends what the, what the team want to do. Yeah, I think, I think it's, um, you know, it fits for you, it fits for me. Um, it comes back to in your selection of people, you know, trying to get good fits for, for people who want to think. And, and, exactly, and you yeah. know, the, the Bridgewater example is a, is a good example in terms of, I think they've been called a cult rather than a culture. <laughs> and and, and, I, and I, I could see that, right? Because it actually when you're trying to bring people in, uh, this is a, let's call it a new way of thinking, but, I've seen other examples as well, you know, in, in our, in our, in my own industry in sales and marketing that I, we're in, you know, I'm, I, it was a similar thing around data, right? You know, it, it, when, when data started to become the thing in marketing, mm-hmm. it was, you know, are we being too data driven right mm-hmm. now? You know, where, where's the, where's the human, where's the gut feel, 
mm-hmm. is the creativity, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And that's creativity from a marketing perspective or a creativity from a, uh, a sales perspective. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Let's let the data make the decisions. And, and, and all of these things are highly nuanced, of course, in, a, in an organization. But I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting kind of example. But so let, let, let's go through some of the tools, you know, in terms of we talked about crucial conversations um, I think uh, we've talked about honesty and transparency, uh, but what, what are the things should the listeners be thinking about Joe in terms of, you know, as I said, it's a, this isn't just about startups or fast growing businesses, you know, it's about managing mm-hmm. teams really, but what, what are the th- practical things do you talk about with your clients in terms of tool set that they can use in the business? Um, well, the first thing, if you look at that identity, then um, I'm a big fan of Myers-Briggs. You know, again, it's one of those things, some people are into it or, or not, but C is an introduction to just appreciating not just yourself, but your opposite. So Myers-Briggs will give you a four-letter personality type. It's more of a cognitive style than a personality type for me, but if you look at that and then look at your opposite, and then you can start to develop an appreciation, it's quite easy to look at something like a Myers-Briggs or even like a disc or any of these things and go, yeah, ha ha, I am a bit like that, right? But if you start to really appreciate what that means in a team dynamic, you know, like take that up to the next level. It is to do with your um, cognitive style, how you process information. So I'm always, I always want to advocate for that because I just think it's such a powerful thing. When you look at um, these mechanisms, these conversational mechanisms, uh, well, quickly, a quick shout out again for the Alliance, you know, that is the one of yeah. the best frames that. that you can pull people together to say this is where we are going because you've got to have that objective clear this is where we're going is that what you want do you want to be on this journey with us because here's what it's going to be like and it's not going to be what it was like in the past um and you people make the choice ownership they give some ownership and also you understand more about them about like who do they want to become and what is the skill set so definitely the alliance what I really like in um, conversations is to, I really like Disney's tool for creativity. So Walt Disney recognized brainstorming is a disaster for the reasons that you talked about um, before, where if people are just shooting from the hip, they haven't really thought anything through. Like if you get somebody who is a bit of a wacky thinker and somebody who's a total cynic, you depend. it depends on the power dynamics, right? So the wacky idea comes out, the cynic shoots them down because the cynic's hierarchically or even if it's not, you know, just in that team dynamic, there's a power dynamic there. Well, that's it. Wacky idea person is not bringing anything else up because now I feel stupid. And I don't like being stupid, like blah, 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 blah. Like all of this stuff happens. So Walt doesn't he recognize that. And for creative ideas, he had uh, three rooms, the, the dreamer, the realist and the critic. So when everybody was in the dreamer room, it was only big ideas, no criticism nothing to like build on stuff just go for the craziest craziest thing that we can then the whole team go to the realist room and then it's like what's the best idea what do we like about those ideas how do we make that a reality and then the whole team go into the the critic room this is what i mean about the mechanisms it's those containers for people to think in so you're giving them your hey see wacky person we need you because the, the best ideas start as something that's crazy normally right so let's get as many of them in as possible. And the people who are cynics, like try and immerse yourself in it. You're probably not going to come up with something uh, crazy, right? Because it's just not how you're wired. But learn to appreciate why what they're doing is important. And then you reverse that at the other end, going, I know that you think the cynics are always trying to tear your ideas down, but they're the ones that will help us to manage the risk and understand where this thing can go wrong. So it really increased his depth of appreciation. There's a couple of others like Pixar's um, Brain Trust, which is another feedback mechanism. What I like about that is that when the creative takes her idea in, that, um, that council, you know, this Brain Trust thing, it's made up of people with all sorts of different perspectives and they're all chipping in and you're there to hear that, right? That's the whole purpose of that thing. But they're not trying to design by committee. They're saying, here are all these experts' points of view. You now are free to take what you want and leave what you want. Now, if you come into a room like that and it's got full of experts and you disregard everything that everybody's got to say, well, you're an idiot. Like, you know, you're off the team. But 
there are things that you'll say that doesn't sound right. Mm, that is a good idea. I'd never thought about that. And it opens you uh, your thinking up and it encourages that level of challenge, but you leave with ownership. So if you have a, a situation where I bring in an idea, it gets fed back on and then I leave and it doesn't feel like it's my idea anymore. Well, you've, you've no ownership, you've no commitment to it. So that, I think that's another good tool. Um, and these are all dependent on the context. You want to encourage that creativity, you want the wacky idea, use Disney. But be mindful at the end of that process, you could end up with nothing because you could take an idea through and the, the, there's just not enough in it. So don't set the outcome that you are always going to create the magic. There's a guy I work with at um, an organization called School of Code and he talks about stumbling across the magic. That you, you can't send people into a room and say, right, you've got two, <laughs> you've got two hours, <laughs> create some magic and then bring the magic out. Like you, it might happen or it might not but it's increasing the collisions and giving people per permission to try the stuff without the pressure that, right, we've got 10 minutes to go, we better come up with the magic here. Again, it just depends on the, the context. So there are loads of those different tools, like Myers-Briggs, check out the Alliance, the Disney process, and um, Pixar's one, Gary Klein's pre-mortem is another uh, good process where you're saying, you're, you're telling people, it's on you to tell us what's wrong with this. You know, so if you've got something, tell us, because if you don't and it goes wrong, then we've lost. The reason that you're in the room is to, to help us to see what could go wrong, right? So just take the, that ego part out of it. Like, you've got that permission to do it. So that's what I mean about those, those mechanisms, the, the rules for the discussion. Um, really powerful. Yeah, no, completely. And, and um, everything you mentioned there resonates with with me in one way or another in terms of, and I, as I said, it, it, uh, if I think about the high performance teams that I've worked in, they've always had characteristics um, of, of some of the things that you mentioned there. I think the great thing is today is you don't have to rely on your HR team to, uh, to kind of come up with this stuff. This is stuff that's available, books, you know, people like yourself um, that you can learn from, you know, these things don't, uh, happen by accident. There is a, a perception that business is a almost like some sort of ongoing party that everybody turns up every day and it kind of all happens and it's fantastically easy. It's not, it's hard. And these kind of tools that you're talking about, if at any level, if you're in sales, marketing, uh, if you're CEO, CMO, you know, chief sales officer, whatever you are, these are practical tools that will help you um, in every day achieve results, right? I think that's the, but it's, that's the magic dust. There's, there's just very little time that is spent on these topics. And I think it's because it's so difficult um, mm. uh, because, you know, people uh, the most important thing in business, but also the most difficult thing in business. But we actually, as you know, as business owners, spend a disproportionate amount of time on other stuff, which is crazy, yep. right? Yep. So, I think hopefully this kind of podcast, and that's why I wanted to get you know people like yourself on, is where we can actually talk practical steps, practical tools. Um, but Joe, look, it's been great. What? Where, where, where should people reach out to you if they want to know more about these tools? Obviously you've mentioned them, we'll put it in the show, show notes and we'll, we'll provide links. But if they want to reach out to you and talk to you more about this kind of thing, um, where, what's the best way to do that? Uh, they can find me josephtrodden.com um, and on LinkedIn. Um, I, think, I think I've got Joe Trodden on LinkedIn. You know, the benefits of an unusual name, right? Uh, but yeah, Lucky so man. LinkedIn, LinkedIn's my, my, my key channel, I put um, things there as well. But yeah, the, like the, the, the key thing is um, people subscribing to this type of stuff. Like we're going to do this work and we're not going to skirt around the edges of it. Um, when you talk about the time, you know, it's Abraham Lincoln's thing, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but you know, if I had eight hours to cut down a tree, I'd spend seven and a half hours sharpening the axe. And Einstein's the same thing. Like you, you would spend 90% of the time working out what is the problem and 10% on the solution. So it's, it is about how much time people are uh, willing to give this. Having people that want to do it, and it's not a witch hunt, it's about your own development, right? So, but having the people that want to do it first, having that alignment, and then the team going, 
let's let's make sure we spend time working out what's going on because if we get that right everything else will flow from it yeah completely well we, I, we you know the the topic of this podcast was high performance and it's a it's a word people bang around a lot but actually this is the kind of ingredient um if if you and this is what helped me in businesses i'd worked in another industry which was all about high performance and achieving a result and these kind of things although they although they may be talked uh, called other things or talked you know mm. called um, or other techniques or other tools, this is what it was all about. And I think, um, so it's a definition of, of high performance, but it's hard. It takes time. You have to be unbelievably patient as well, right? Because this is, uh, you mentioned uh, Myers-Briggs, right? Now, yep. that's a great example of this stuff, right? Is this kind of thing, people do it once every two years. Sure. Right, produce a report, send it to, and I've done this as well, send it to the mm -hmm. individuals, have a workshop, and then nothing else, right? Sure. And, but we expect the result and an impact, or, and then we kind of go around on a hamster wheel. And in our own business, um, in businesses that I've worked with and work with now that think and focus on this stuff and put the time behind it, um, they get huge results, massive massive uh you know performance increases but be patient take time mm. speak mm. to people like joe uh because no one's an expert and you you kind of need that outside lens and i think that's what joe does really go really well so joe look appreciate it um thanks for taking the time and we'll do this again and maybe deep dive um and also maybe show some examples uh which is um in some podcasts that i want to do is to kind of deep dive into a topic and show some evidence-based stuff. So that would be cool. Um, and we can swing back to that in the next few months. Cool, man. Look forward to it. Cheers, Joe. Thanks.